I think we're live now. It's hard to tell. Let me know if you could hear me. It's Doug Cuttington here from Niche Site Project. And hopefully I'll hear myself, but it's always good to get confirmation from the live crowd. Hope everyone's doing well today. It is uh, Christmas week, so a little, little quieter probably a little quieter, although I just did an interview with uh, someone. So a few people are, are uh, you know, in the office. It was another entrepreneur type. So you're always like kind of in the office, kind of not in the office. I do have my Dwight Schrute holiday shirt here, which some people will recognize. Uh, the font is very small, but you can see the snowman here. People know about this specific episode, uh, just mention it in the chat and let me know the volume levels as well. I think we're in pretty good shape. I will answer some questions. I'll talk about niche sites, of course, and maybe keyword research, whatever questions you have. I'll tell some stories. We're just going to hang out here. In the thumbnail, I did show myself holding a beer. So even though um, I wasn't planning on having a beer, I did get one of these uh, Oscar Blues 1E. It is a 1E, and it's a 100-calorie hazy IPA, 4%, so pretty good day drinker overall. Oh, and Gaz is on loud and clear. What's going on? And Adam confirms as well. Thanks a lot. Much appreciated. Yeah, I just recorded a podcast uh, for you know the other show that I do, so I do Mile High Fi with Carl Jensen. There's a link in the show uh, notes in the description here. And we did an interview today with a guy named Dan Sheeks. He recently published a book and we kind of figured out like the right way to interview people when they're promoting a book, which, you know, sometimes they just want to talk about their book over and over again. So we, we get away from that, uh, sometimes, uh, and we, we actually did this once where we we read the book and then we asked a lot of questions all about the book, which turned out to be not very exciting for us. And then the, the person was just like reciting passages from the book. I mean, they weren't reading directly, but they were very close connected with the information in the book. So it was really easy for them to just pair it back the same answers they always give. So anyway, we have figured out a better way to do that, which, I mean, I think I generally have done that in the past, but you know, working in a different format, like Carl and I just did things a little differently. Anyway, that show is called Mile High Fi. And we talk about personal finance and financial independence and stuff like that. So it will be fantastic if people do check that out. There's actually a link to my affiliate marketing podcast too. It's called The Doug Show. But I talk about side hustles and affiliate marketing and all sorts of things like that. And you could check those out. would really appreciate it. Gaz says that you're sipping a vintage cider. So I'm going to wait a few minutes before I crack this baby open, but it should be, should be pretty good. I didn't bring a glass down here. It's fine. I'll just drink it from the can. And Jeremy says, thanks for doing a live stream this week. Yeah. I wonder if like some of the other crew is uh, you know, not doing their normal live streams. I'm not sure, but it's largely normal here. And Carlos is on also. Thanks everyone. Oh, and David, is one of the fine moderators. I can't remember who all the moderators are. Um, oh, I can see the blue, the blue on there. So yeah, if anybody has questions, let me know. I will quickly plug the couple sponsors for today. One of them is Ezoic and their Leap product. So definitely worth checking out. It helps your site get green and core web vitals. And the extra thing from Ezoic is something I should show you. There's actually a couple extra links. So they, they have a bit of a promotion going on, which I will just share my screen because that'll be easier for me to do. So from my community, the Niche Site Project community, and you watching this now, whether it's live or the replay, you potentially could win the top performer from my community. And basically, there's going to be a, like an awards, publisher awards ceremony in January, the middle of January. 
And there's all these different participating community. They call us leaders. So I'll take that, I suppose. But there's all these different communities and you fit into the Doug Cunnington niche site project community. So if you use Ezoic, you can enter here. Now you have a deadline of December 31st for the community top performer. You can just fill out this information. You can see it's very straightforward. There is a link in the description. So if you're doing something else, you can check it out later, but you have a pretty good chance of winning this overall. And what do you win? You get some, well, yeah, what do you win here? You will win Ezoic merchandise and a cash bonus of 50% of your January earnings. The thing is, you some of the merchandise will be a shirt with uh, Ezoic and uh, Doug Cunnington branding on there. I actually have one of those shirts, but whenever I get a new shirt, I always wash it first. I don't know if everyone does that. I always wash it first. So it's in the laundry. I don't have it. Um, I'm not wearing it, obviously. <laughs> so, but the big thing, the big thing is the cash bonus of 50% of your January earnings. And side note on the Ezoic uh, t-shirt thing, um, you, you'll get other merchandise as well, but the t-shirt, I mean, it just has my name on it. And one thing is it'd be weird if I just like wore a shirt with my own name on it. Like if I wore my own shirt with my name on it, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I will wear it at some point because they sent it to me. And it is a thing that I need to do. The other portion from Ezoic is they have a publisher of the year and you could win $5,000. So the thing is you will have to enter this one sooner. The deadline for this one is December 22nd. All right, December 22nd. So at the time that we're recording this live, it is tomorrow. So you need to finish it, like do it, watch it, watch this, and then go do it. So anyway, a couple things from Ezoic, shout out to them. And then Otis is one of the other sponsors and I'll hold on for that for a little while. Hold on for a little bit. Oh, and Zach, Zach mentions... You're still drinking coffee, all right? But you'll add some whiskey to blend in. Yeah, the, the interesting thing with the holiday weeks and there's more days like this coming coming along, but you know, we're not we're not traveling or anything this year, but a lot of times we would go to maybe like a cabin or we would hang out at um, like family homes or whatever, and you're just there for days and you know, we're, I'm a drinker, you know, we, we drink. So what would happen is, um, yeah, we would just like kind of sip drinks like all through the week, like basically afternoon forward. And of course, like that'll wear on you day after day. It's not healthy. You know, kids don't do that, but you know, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun pastime. I'm not a sports fan myself, but a lot of people, you know, they watch, watch the games and actually the, the beer helps the sports go by a little faster and it's not so boring. But anyway, that'll be, um, that'll be an activity, but we're just sticking around here. So we're, you know, not necessarily going to be drinking all day. The other part is, um, if you're around family all the time, the drinks also help that go by a little faster too. And all right. So Gus says we touched on the sandbox last, last week, even though my site is still on parole, there is a glimpse of an upward trajectory trend, which is nice, very good. And that is, I mean, that's really what you want to see is a, a little bit of an uptick with impressions. That's the sort of leading indicator that you're kind of moving up and you're showing up in the SERPs. And then hopefully after that, you'll start ranking and actually, you know, bringing in traffic and getting clicks for those specific queries and keywords. So as I am waiting for other questions and stuff, one cool thing, and I, I talk about the, the podcast a lot because I really, I enjoy the podcast format very much. And I'm a podcast listener myself. I am doing this other show and it's going to be part of a network. So Carl 
Jensen and myself are, you know, teaming up and we have our show. And basically we're going to have other shows underneath our umbrella of network. So currently I don't have any other show that I'm going to be on, but there will be another show within the network. And then Carl is doing a show with a a co-host, which is yet to be announced, but I was chatting with them today and it sounds like they're going to launch in January and they're going to be moving forward in January, which is pretty cool and exciting. So I'm excited about just moving forward and seeing where it goes. Like I said, I, I love the format and I'm essentially serving as a kind of an, an executive producer for one of the other shows, which could be going live at any any moment. Um, it, it potentially will be before Christmas. So that's why I'm saying it could be at any time, but I'm not 100% sure. But it's pretty fun to do sort of the executive producing and help people like develop their show some. Alex, what's going on? Good to see you here. And then we have Carlos with a question. If you had $1,000 to invest in your already existing affiliate site, what would it be? Content, backlinks, marketing? Yep, so it depends. Probably, there's probably a very good chance I would just get more content and maybe a little bit of that capital towards backlinks. But the thing is, most of the time you're going to get a sooner return. You're going to get more information on whether or not the investment worked from content versus backlinks. So, and the, the other hard part with backlinks, Carlos, is depending on how you're getting those backlinks, they might just be garbage and they might not ever help you out. So, one side note, and I don't talk about this too much, but I'm not going to talk about the company. All right, I'm going to pop this beer open again for the people just joining. This is a one the Oscar Blues Hazy 100 Calorie IPA, 4%. It's a good shower beer. You guys do shower beers? It's one of the great luxuries in the world, shower beers. It's so cold. Love showers. So the thing is, with the backlinks, and depending on the company, they may not be any good. And there was a company that contacted me in the last week, and they really wanted me to do a promo for you know all, all the things I do. So send out emails, do this. They wanted like a dedicated email as well. They they weren't they weren't going to be happy with me just saying, Hey, if you, if you need some backlinks and whatever, they wanted like a full on marketing push. And there's a couple, couple things, you know, number one, I don't, I, I don't promote that many things. This is the week of Christmas. And I was like, I'm not going to promote anything this week. You know, people should either not be spending any money or spending it like buying gifts for their loved ones or whatever. And they really wanted me to run run the ad. But one, one trick that a lot of people do when they're specking out business or a proposal or something like that, if they don't want to do it, they just make it very expensive. So if you get a contractor to take a look at your project in your backyard and they don't want to do it or they're really busy, they, they might just make it very expensive then you probably won't pick them. But if you do, it'll be worth their while. So basically I priced it pretty high and I also anti-sold it too. So I was like, I don't think it's going to convert that well. It's Christmas week. People are probably not going to buy it. And they they did their best to try to negotiate, but I was like, I don't want to do it. So I'm just going to, I'm not flexible. So here's the price. If you want to do it, that's the price. And uh, luckily, they, they didn't want to move forward with it. But the whole point is sometimes the backlinks are crappy. The thing is, I have heard back from people that use the company based on my recommendation. And they were like, these links were kind of crappy. And I looked at them and I was like, I don't think they're that great either. So 
of course, the company was like, we have wonderful reviews on uh, these business review sites. Like our, our customers are super happy. But unfortunately, the specific customers which I have recommended were not happy. So that's, you know, another reason why I priced it high. So luckily, I made it high enough where they were like, ah, yeah, we're going to pass. So it's tough sometimes. I mean, they're like, we, we just want to pay you money. We just send out the email. But I resisted and I was like, nah, not going to do it. Not this time around. All right. In Carlos, a couple people chime in. Zach says it totally depends on where the site is. And Gaz mentions that he's getting some impressions. He's seeing that things are working out on his site. So if people have followed along, his site's a few months old. Basically not really getting any movement as far as impressions or uh, traffic or anything like that. But it's slowly working out. Patience is a virtue, indeed. Carlos mentions... It's 18 months old. The blog is, uh, there's 50 blog posts, but you're not making any money yet. Okay. And I would say at 18 months, you should be out of the sandbox. Should be out of the sandbox. So I would look and try and figure out what is going on. Are you getting any traffic? You're not making any money, but are you getting any traffic? Are you ranking for anything? How do you feel the quality is uh, on the content, Carlos? Is is the um, is the content really good, or is it is it was it outsourced and it's kind of not very good? What do you think? All right, if you have a second, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, uh, interact with it. If you're watching the replay later, please leave a comment. It helps out the stream and. And all that stuff. God says, that's what I love about the stream. You're hanging out, having a beer, no crap, just hanging out with like-minded people and talking. Indeed, yeah, it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. I, I think I mentioned last week, these live streams don't really bring in any new people, but they're pretty fun. So keep doing them. People show up, you know, there's just enough people showing up. I mean, there was a time when I would get like 50 or 60 people on the live streams, but maybe it's the time of day or I haven't been sending emails out too. Plus, I probably complain like half the time. Who wants to watch that? Dane says, I assume Amazon is cool with mentioning drugs and alcohol if they're not on the affiliate articles, but on other pages. Consult your legal counsel and lawyer. This is not legal advice, but I believe that is correct. I think you can put things that Amazon would probably have an issue with, as long as there are other pages where you're not linking to Amazon using your affiliate link, I think that is okay. Technically, I believe the operating agreement gives Amazon the ability to kick you out for basically any reason. If they, if they don't want to work with you, I think they can kick you out. They're, I, I am not 100% sure like how in like all-encompassing that is, but it is potentially one of those things where if you had you know re really offensive or controversial content on another page they potentially can still say you know what we don't like it over there even though it's not on a page where you're linking to uh amazon using your affiliate link i think they probably can still they probably st can still give you a hard time about it Alex says, have I done a video on how to conduct due diligence on links you have purchased? No, that's a pretty good idea, though. What, um, that's a great, that's a great video idea. I should write that down. 
Haseem, what's going on? Good to see you. So I'm at, and I'm literally I'm writing it down here. Due diligence on links. UK Beauty Room says, I've been hit badly by the Google product review update. Do I know whether it's possible to recover from an algorithm update? Sorry to hear it. That sucks. Yes, it is possible to recover. Many times it's going to be a sort of a slow process. So at a minimum, it would probably be two to three months or so is kind of what I have heard. The best cases that I've seen require you to publish, don't follow this like a prescription or a recipe or anything, but basically if you're able to publish a lot of content that sort of makes up for the product reviews, maybe you had a high number of product reviews or something like that, or maybe the quality wasn't super great, like you potentially could go update, improve the content that you have in the product review update. Perhaps you have more original images and other content, original content that shows that it's unique and it's a solid review. Additionally, it would be very good to publish other like informational content if you did have a high percentage of affiliate product review kind of content. So it is possible if you don't have very many backlinks, if you were able to get like very good, very relevant backlinks, that potentially can help as well. So Basically, you have to make up for, you know, the issues that you had in the past and you may be able to recover. And by the way, let us know like what percentage of your content was affiliate review related. And guys asked Carlos what traffic you're getting after 18 months and mentions you, you've watched a good video today about making Article headlines stand out in competitive niches. All right. And it seems says you, uh, you have a team for your new project. Cool. Okay. And Alex mentions um, like reviewing links from a good source and analyzing those. Cool. That makes sense. Mom Van Up says you're enjoying the content. Thanks. Oh, and Zach says maybe a whole video series on the process, when to buy links, where to buy links, and where to place them, how much to pay, due diligence, and testing whether they worked or not. Okay, very cool. Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, I mean, from my perspective, it would be fairly easy to fairly easy to, you know, people are interested in that topic or they're like, I hate links and I'll never do it. But from, you know, creating content and having it pay off for me, that's a pretty decent one because I can say, here's great sources to buy your links. These are trusted, trusted companies. Right. Carlos says you're getting 400 page views a month, mostly organic, and it seems to increase. You wrote most of the posts and outsourced about a quarter of it. 60% are how to, 40% are affiliate. And the first, besides the first 10 articles, they are high quality. Okay. So it sounds like you have a pretty good. A pretty good percentage. It sounds like it's reasonably high quality content wise. I think 400 page views a month is still low. 
for that amount of content. So I'm not sure what's going on, but something, I would say something is wrong. I would say something is wrong with 50 posts in, you know, that's, that's not very much traffic overall. So something's wrong. It could be, it could be something simple, right? It could be some sort of like weird link structure. It could be keyword stuffing. It could be, you know, something minor that you could actually fix pretty easily. So it's most likely worthwhile to check with someone who's more experienced than you to have a look and see if it's something simple like that. Alex says, what niches are good for beginners? So let's try a different different way to handle this question. For the frequent viewers, you know, I'd give uh, some kind of a non-answer here, but actually, why don't we just ask in the chat, what are good niches for beginners? Let's try something different. And UK Beauty Room says, thanks for the advice. My blog is 99% affiliate content. I'm making YouTube videos for all the product reviews now and embedding them in the blog post and you hope that'll help you recover. Yeah, pretty decent idea to do YouTube videos. And, you know, at this point, I don't know how much content you had on your site, but when I, one of the things I did on a couple sites that I've worked on is I either joined a project or acquired a site and it was 90% affiliate content and it was doing pretty well, but immediately I wanted to switch it over to at least 50% informational content, how to kind of articles, not affiliate focused, not product focused at all. So you, um, if you're able to just publish a lot more content that's informational, it will probably help. Okay. Guys, uh, says best ballpoint pens as a joke. That's one of my go-tos. I haven't mentioned best ballpoint pens in a very long time. And David says, whatever niche you're interested in. Yeah, so I think having, you don't have to be passionate about a specific niche, but if you have some interest, that'll be really helpful because as you're hearing, sometimes it's going to take a little while to get traffic. Sometimes it's going to be hard. Sometimes you might have a lot of traffic and then an algorithm will come along and goof things up for you. So if you're interested in it, at least you can keep moving forward because you have an intrinsic drive around that specific topic area. Mom Van says, I'm hoping to level up my game in 2022. You just finished your first year of blogging. You're making $50 a month and it's tempting to buy a high dollar course to make money or to make magic money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have one of those high dollar courses, which I'll be selling in like a month or so. Keep an eye out. I was going to say, oh yeah, one thing I always forget to plug. Um, in actually just a couple weeks, I'm going to be doing a free three-part email course, which I, I send it out quarterly. So people have heard me talk about it before. And... Essentially, it helps prime you to grow your existing site or to start a brand new site. And it's a free three-part email series. Uh, several people on this live stream have actually gone through it. So if you sign up for the email list, go over to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, enter your name and email. I'll send you all my templates and systems and helpful things like that. And then in a couple weeks, when I do send out that free three-part email series, you will get those emails. <laughs> all right. And for Alex asking about niches for beginners, Zach mentions anything you're passionate about with a few exceptions. For example, avoid make money online, anything to do with evergreen keywords, health, and finance. 
yeah, I would stay away from the your money or your life. So anything health or money, finance related. Make money online is a tough one, even though a lot of people are interested in it. You're competing with marketers who have done it for a long time. However, I was going to say, I started to make money online. Essentially, that's what I do, right? And it's been fine. It's, of course, been challenging. But, I mean, even in really competitive things, like new people can show up and make it work. So if you're passionate about it, you can get into it. But if it's something like uh, health or medical related, like that's going to be a tough one. And you should be a doctor if you're going to mess with that. Alexander says uh, left-handed poetry. All right. That's a good one too. Jeremy says pick a niche you're interested in or something you want to learn about. Perfect. God says, focus on a hobby and drill down. Mom Van says, just start. No better way to learn. And Carlos says, anything you're passionate about. So I think we have a pretty good consensus here. And I like what Zach mentioned about anything without evergreen keywords and staying away from health and finance. So find something you're interested in. It's probably going to be fine as long as there's products around it. The one thing, and it shouldn't be too much of an issue, but if it happens to be something where all of the products are very cheap and inexpensive, it's probably going to be hard to make a big amount of money. And big is a relative term, but if it's something... For example, like if you if you pick uh, like the book niche, sure, there's some expensive books, but most of them are fairly inexpensive, like under 20 bucks. So even if you sell a high volume of them, you have to sell like a crazy number of books to earn very much. So that's a pretty, that's a tough one. Oh, and uh, Gaz says, I'd love to know about when you started out. So, yeah, yeah, I'll come back to that. And, oh, and Ariel, uh, what's going on? You say, why evergreen? I, so I misspoke earlier. It's anything without evergreen keywords. So evergreen keywords are good. So the absence of evergreen is what we're talking about. Joanne's on... Carlos says, any suggestions using Pinterest to drive traffic? So I actually have a couple blog posts on that. So you can check it out and someone, if you just go to my site, you can find it if you search for it. Zach does mention that Pinterest has been tough. Their algorithm is going the way of Facebook's promoting things that keep people on Pinterest instead of driving traffic to external blogs. And I was going to say, one of my observations is in the last, I would say like three years, I would hear people really talking about Pinterest traffic and how great it was. In the last year or so, I haven't heard a peep from anyone talking about Pinterest traffic. The little bit that I have heard about is courses that have updated to deal with the Pinterest algorithm updates. So my hunch is that it's kind of tough to get people off of the platform. And Joanne, any questions out there? Okay. And guys, I didn't forget. I will come back when I can talk about getting started. This means war, says, what are my thoughts on the social media platforms, Facebook, Insta, Pinterest, making changes to their algorithms to suppress content that makes that takes a user off of the platform? My thoughts generally are that it's not surprising. We have seen this happen again and again. So if you had, I mean, I knew people that had like giant Facebook 
like fan pages or company pages or some sort of a big following. And then all of a sudden their reach went down to like 10% of what it was and they were unable to reach their audience anymore without paying for it. And their business model kind of fell apart. I don't really enjoy a lot of the social media platforms in general. Um, Instagram, I do waste time on. It's a pretty fun one. And YouTube, oh, technically, it's uh, it's kind of in the middle. I mean, YouTube functions in a lot of ways like a social media platform, but it is, you know, a lot of content up front first. So number one, not a surprise. And I think like any social media platform eventually will start charging the advertisers to reach the users on the other end. And, you know, I, I go, like I said, I do use, um, Instagram and I am, I'm the product, right? So the old, the, the thing that people say is like, if, if you're using, if you're using something and you're now I'm going to, I'm going to screw it up. If, if you're not paying for it, I'm going to fuck up the whole thing. Someone's going to correct it. But basically if you're using social media as the user, like you're the product, you're the thing being sold. So basically I haven't spent much time on the platforms and, you know, a while back I decided, you know what? I don't care about Facebook. I don't want to spend time on there. I don't want to put my stuff on there. And I just decided not to worry about it. And things have been fine. Same with Pinterest. I mean, I heard all the case studies like, oh, now I'm getting all this traffic from Pinterest. And I decided not to worry about it either. I did test Pinterest for one specific site um, and never really got much traction over there. I even followed along with um, a couple courses and did, you know, all the right things. But for whatever reason, it never quite worked out. Now, the the other thing that uh, this means war mentions, I think that will, will only continue because platforms can't make money if the user leaves. It won't be long until they are silos. Yeah, totally. Downside to drinking carbonated beverage makes you burp a little. There's no way around that. <laughs> yeah, okay, Ariel, thank you. When the service is free, you're the product. Yeah, much more concise. That's that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the idea. So that said, um, about the social media platforms, I actually had a call with someone today for like helping me promote some of the podcasts and other things that I do on social media. So these long form Q and A's probably wouldn't work that well. However, the other show mile high Fi, Carl and I actually have pretty like well-known guests. And if we had clips of those, they probably would do pretty well on social media. One thing I did the other day on uh, my dog Georgie's Instagram, she does have an Instagram, I put one of her videos on Reels and then I allowed it to be shared on Facebook with people that were not connected with. So instead of the normal like 50 or 100 views, it got like 4,000. So I do see a path where I can use the social media platforms as a tool, not my primary um, way to reach like new audiences, but just like part of the tool, um, part of the tool set to reach new audiences. So that could be really valuable in the long run. I'm not sure how it'll look exactly, but you know, a one minute clip of an interview with someone pretty famous would probably work well. And then we could direct people back to whatever we want them to do, whatever the call to action is, which probably would be go listen to our podcast and they would have to look it up. There is some disconnect. And to your point, I mean, the platforms want to keep people on the platform. They don't want people to leave and do something else. So that's part of the struggle. 
And, you know, one of the things with YouTube, it's like, I want people to sign up for my email list, but Google, YouTube technically doesn't really want people to leave the platform. They want you to watch like more and more videos. So it's a little bit of a balance. And I decided I just, I got to do, you know, my thing and not worry too much about the specific platforms and not using any one platform to like grow or rely on or anything like that. And that's why like the email list is so important. My own website's so important. Having my own podcast, which is, you know, independent, like anyone can, can grab that. So very valuable to have your own stuff, not built on other platforms. UK Beauty says, my Pinterest traffic has always been consistent, but with Google, I've had two huge traffic drops. I don't think Pinterest has the huge ups and downs that Google has. Oh, good point. Good point. God says, I didn't, uh, didn't I hear that Google's last update was somehow ranking Pinterest pages higher than good content? Could have been. I wonder for specific niches, maybe. And this means more. It says, I remember the day when it was suggested to start a Facebook group, Insta page, Pinterest account, Twitter. And now you hear crickets. Yeah. Okay. So quick, uh, another pl quick plug for, actually, I see we have 32 people on, which is great. 31. Um, if you can hit the thumbs up, that would be fantastic. And don't forget, if you're watching the replay, you can leave a comment. So what questions do we have out here? I was about to mention our sponsor, Otis. That's O-D-Y-S that you can get age domains from. We talked about the Sandbox a couple times already today, and it is a common question. One thing you can do is get an age domain from a company like Otis, and they basically have relevant backlinks and a history. So most of the time, not always, but most of the time you can assume that you're going to have a much shorter sandbox. I've seen some great case studies recently where, especially if you add a lot of content to one of these age domains, you can end up ranking much more quickly. And I think, um, you know, one other thing we don't talk about as often is if you have an existing site, you actually can buy the domain, then redirect it to your existing domain and then get all those links pointing to your existing site. And you can follow the link in the description here for Otis. And if you join using my affiliate link, you can get $100 in your account and I'll get a small commission if you actually join and make any purchases or anything like that. Scott says, I'm new to your channel and it's great content. Appreciate it. When we start blogging, how many articles do you recommend to write before outsourcing? Interesting question. I would say it'd be good to maybe write like, you know, five or 10 if you want to get the hang of the process. And if you understand the process, it's a little bit easier to outsource. If you have the revenue not revenue, but if you have the, the capital to invest and have people write for you sooner, there's no reason why you shouldn't. The content agency model is pretty mature these days. So you pretty much, you pretty much can just hire a company, let them know your site, let them know your niche. They'll probably do the keyword research for you and then they'll publish it directly for you. So you don't have to write anything yourself technically, but if you did want to understand the process and learn a little bit about your niche, you know, five or 10 articles should give you enough information where you feel comfortable outsourcing it and you have a better understanding of the topic area. Joanne says, I'm, uh, you're not sure what you're looking out for with an age domain. Do I have a video? I don't have a video 
specifically on like how to choose. But basically, if you search on, I guess like, I'm trying to remember the name of the website. I think it was expireddomains.net. You can end up with just a bunch of random stuff. Essentially, it's a aggregated list of domains that have expired. So most of it is not very good. The advantage with a company like Otis is they've kind of curated everything already. So they only get domains that are good, basically. So you should still go through and double check, but you're paying a premium for the domains in general. So like if we were to go and look over at Otis right here, I mean, you can see some of them are pretty expensive, like 10,000 bucks for modern comment. And then some are a little cheaper depending on the history and the quality of the backlinks. Climate Games, for example, is about 2,000 bucks. So you're paying like a pretty good chunk of change. And they do give you a solid amount of information, but what I would generally do, Joanne, is go over to a tool like Hrefs and then double check what the backlink profile is like. And generally, again, anything on Otis is probably gonna be fine in high quality, but you see they have a lot of backlinks from great sources over here. The thing you have to look out for is if you see like a lot of weird links pointing at the site, which, you know, wouldn't be listed here on the Otis page necessarily. But if you looked deep into the database over on Hrefs, you might see some. Again, I have ne like in the dozens of domains that I've looked at at Otis, I've never seen any that had like questionable links. Again, they vet everything. They, they're purchasing these at, you know, a pretty decent price, I see, I would expect. So these are high quality. You should always double check before you plunk down the money. Um, and you can see, you know, a lot more domains um, over here that point to this site, but th those are kind of the main things to look for. And then Joanne, the, the final thing that is probably the most important is find, finding something relevant. So you need, you need it to be relevant. Otherwise it's kind of, it's not going to help you basically. So if your site is, you know, beauty related, like UK beauty room, I suspect, like you'd want to find something in that industry where the links are relevant to your site and the links make sense pointing to your site currently and then you'll get the value from it. All right, uh, UK Beauty Room uh, for link building. You're trying to get links from Haro at the moment. My friend has a, a service and it's over at uh, Skip Blast. Dot com. My friend Shauna Newman, I've interviewed her a couple times on this channel, but she has a Haro service and the results are very good there. So you can go check it out. Um, you could let her know that I sent you over there. Blah Blah says, is it a good approach just to write all informational posts on a niche site without worrying about keywords? I would say no. I would say that is not a good approach. But I'm a person who talks about keywords a lot. So even if you're not doing like keyword research, you should like understand the topic area that you're writing about. So I would say it's worth it to worry about the topics, the keywords, and understand if people are actually searching for those things in some capacity. Again, I'm biased. I think keyword research is important, but some people don't. Although I would say if you look at, you know, big 
search engine marketing companies that provide the tools for us, like SEMrush or Hrefs or KW Finder. Like usually it's a suite of tools and typically it's pretty important to have some idea about the keywords. Usually it's a, a piece of the puzzle. Scott says, what are my thoughts on alternative medicine and engineering? I would say engineering, probably good. Alternative medicine is an area of health and medical, which could be an issue. So I would stay away from it. Other people are echoing that and saying that I would avoid health and medicine and that sort of thing. DJ says, what about aging your own domains? So if you just want to age the domain, that is probably not helpful. You are, you should be more interested in the links. So, I mean, DJ, if you want to elaborate, oh, you're saying buy a fresh domain, adding some content and then parking them for a while. I mean, why not just keep, why, why park them? I guess what, to what end, what, what are you trying to do? What's your goal? What's the advantage of publishing content and parking it versus just continuing to publish content and move forward versus buying an age domain? So of course the age domain costs a lot of money. You're buying that history. You're buying those links essentially. All right. So in DJ overall, yeah, that would be fine. You're really not, I mean, you're potentially like publishing something, waiting through the sandbox and then publishing more content. So that could be slightly helpful, but I would say either, you know, just keep publishing, like keep publishing or the other reason you may find that useful is if you're like somehow staggering your sites and you're building a site, publishing, letting it sit, and then building another site, publishing, letting it sit. But then you end up with like multiple different sites. And I started listening to an audio book, which I may, I'll end up doing an episode of a podcast on this, but essentially the danger Here's what happens if you have, let's say you have four sites, you'll work on one site for a little while until you kind of get bored or you reach some plateau and then you start working on the other thing. And then the same thing happens. So you're skipping around to like different things that you're working on and you feel like you're getting a lot done and it's productive, but you've, you're not focusing. You're not, you're just skipping around when you're getting bored. And it could look a little bit different for every person, but essentially that's what's happening. And the book that I'm listening to is uh, 4,000 Weeks. I heard Tim Ferriss featured like one chapter on his podcast. And I heard in a uh, community that, that I'm in, they, they mentioned it. Someone mentioned it in there too. But that's exactly what happens. I mean, people have a few projects going on and when they get bored on one thing, they'll just move on to another. All right. Joanne says, what are my thoughts on sustainable living, gardening, and solar? That seems great. I think those are all hot topic areas and... I have an interest in YouTube and podcasts as I keep talking about over and over again. Those, even if you don't want to, if you have no interest in video or podcasting, that is okay. You might in the future, and the point is those topic areas are very good for podcasting YouTube. Niles says, my blog is 15 months old. It makes $400 a month. 
You have 115 articles, 60% review, 40% informational. It's a seasonal niche. It's out of season now. Is that good? I don't know. That is kind of an impossible question to answer with the information given. In general, well, let me ask you this. Are you happy with it, Niles? Is that where you expect it to be at? How much did you invest into the site? I would say it's probably worth, so if it's 400 bucks a month, so it's probably worth like, say like eleven to $15,000 or so if you were to sell it roughly. So did you, did you put in more than eleven to $15,000 or less? Are you happy with what it's doing right now? Um, it could be on the front end of a very steep growth trajectory. Yeah. Hard question to answer though. Jim's marketing code says, I have my own blogging course, but you're not getting traffic. So you're not making a penny, but you're keeping your head up. It's great info. And yeah, I was, I was going to say, if you have your own blogging course, that would imply that you're an expert in blogging and getting traffic, but it's not getting any traffic, but you should keep your head up. And I, I could tell people as someone who has a couple courses, creating a course is very hard, but it is easy compared to selling a course. Selling a course is very difficult. All right. As well as being a blogger, you're a nurse. In one post, you mentioned that you work in uh, COVID ICU. Will Google remove my page from the search results because it contains the word COVID? I don't know. I don't know, but I would say if it's just if it's just a mention in passing. It seems like that would be okay. It seems like if you're, in my opinion, I, I don't know. But my hunch is if you're not providing any commentary about COVID or anything medical related, it's probably okay. I mean, the fact is the little pandemic thing kind of affected everyone. So I would say it wouldn't be unusual, you know, just thinking about it practically. It wouldn't be weird if someone mentioned the whole pandemic thing in their content somewhere. So seems like it should be okay, especially if you're not making any medical claims or suggestions or anything like that. I turn the uh, furnace off when I do these recordings. It's right over there. Most of the time, I, I don't think like these microphones even pick it up, which is crazy because it's it's a little bit loud. But the mics are good. But it gets cold when I turn off the furnace. That cold, cold, but I'm drinking like a cold beverage here. DJ says you're avoiding shiny object syndrome by all means. Yeah, 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 totally. You know, I talk about uh, Otis and, and, I mean, they sponsor the show. You know, they sponsor the show. So I talk about them. It's a good company, though. It's been great working with them. Niall says you've invested about fourteen or 15000 so far, and the site's making about four hundred, and it is seasonal. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think... Just on the surface, I would have hoped that it was earning a little bit more, but it does depend on the niche and a few other things. The good part is you've invested about fourteen or fifteen thousand, and it seems like that's about how much it's worth. So if you continue earning, and I would say that you should, you know, don't completely neglect it, but you should continue earning money moving forward. So slowly, you will earn your money back. 
And technically the value of the site is what you've invested, which is good. And if the site grows, it will, you know, scale up. I mean, that that's the great thing with these sites. And Jim does clarify, you're not getting traffic to the course. And um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you can teach people to blog. Yeah, selling a course is really hard. Very difficult. And quick, quick reminder, um, if you are not on my email list, you can go to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, enter your name and email. And the reason why it's important is I'm sending out a three-part free email course. It's a little mini course in a couple weeks. So it's not coming out yet, but it'll be like, I think like, yeah, like two weeks, two weeks from now. Crazy, the year is almost over. And basically it kind of primes you for either growing your site or starting a fresh brand new site. Kind of gets you in the right mindset, helps you stay motivated as, you know, as Gaz mentions, you know, you gotta be patient. So going through the three-part email series is really helpful. And I, I send it out usually once a quarter. So like I, I don't talk about it too often, but I do try and get people on board for that. So over at nichesiteproject.com, there's a link in the chat and in the description. You can Google it. It's pretty easy to find. Free email course. What other questions do we have? I am almost almost out of beer and that's how that's how we time these things. Renzo Vet says, thanks for the input. You're welcome. All right. So one thing, I do have my guitars out here, which is, it's dry around here in the winter. Very dry. I think it's like 20%. So I do, I keep these babies in the cases and I have a little humidity thing to, I've gotten a lot more paranoid now that I've gotten like nicer guitars. But in the podcast, Actually, it was published today in the podcast, Mile High Fi. We, Carl and I did like a year end review. So we talked about like our personal year. And then we talked about working on the podcast together and a little bit on how it came about. But I had this idea. It was, it's a funny show. Like it, check it out. If people have not checked out Mile High Fi, today's episode is a great one. So I think it's episode like 34 or something like that. So check out that episode, Mile High Fi, and I had the, the idea, and, and I don't do New Year's resolutions, but I was like, we should come up with resolutions or goals for the other person. So not just our own, but for the other person. I don't even think we did, <laughs> I don't even think we came up with our own specifically. It was just for the other person. But Carl challenged me to, he was like, you got these guitars, you should do an open mic. I'm like, ah, you know, I, I don't know if I want to, I, I don't know, I'll have to practice more and like really like try to have a final product, but it is great to challenge yourself. So anyway, he went to a brewery that one of our friends is an investor in, and I'm not sure if she was there or not, but basically it's down in Denver. There's an open mic on the 30th, December 30th. There's a very high likelihood that I'm going to play that open mic. Now, the thing is I can't sing, so I'll, I'll have to have someone else sing and, but I can, I can strum some chords. So I'm going to try and make it some easy ones. And yeah, I think, I, I think I'm going to do it. Have a little audience there. It'll be fun. Ariel says, sip slowly. I always have questions and then forget when the live starts. All right. Marcus says, you're getting thirsty from hearing about all the beers. All right. So Gaz says, way back when you first started, what sparked your interest to make money online? So I, I remember it specifically. I remember like the, the day of and, and all that stuff. I don't remember exactly what day, but it was March of 2013, I was walking my dog 
it was Brody. He passed away, but I was walking Brody in Dunwoody, Georgia, and I was walking around the neighborhood, basically. And at the time, I was very extremely deep in the homebrew community. And I mean, I still participate quite a bit, but I was brewing a lot of beer. I was doing a lot of homebrew contest judging, and I was listening to podcast after podcast of homebrewing beer content. So I listened to the Brewing Network primarily, a guy named Jamil Zanishef, and I listened to a few of the other shows too, but I was deep into that, and I was getting a little burned out. I was doing it all the time, and I was trying to uh, reach the master level rank of BJCP, which is a very difficult thing to do. I think there's, I think there might be about 500 in the world, something like that. Not many. There's not very many at all. So I was working really hard and I got burned out and I was trying to find a new podcast to listen to. So I was literally browsing around on Apple, iTunes, podcast player, and I found Smart Passive Income. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll download a couple episodes and listen to it. Well, I got completely obsessed and started listening to every episode that I could. And I think I made it all the way through like Pat Flynn's back catalog within like a month or so and got really obsessed. I think I found the Tropical MBA podcast around the same time frame as well. And really quickly, guys, I... I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to start a site. So I think within like five or six weeks, I started my first AdSense site and I made a ton of mistakes. I didn't know what I was doing. And I tried a couple other things. And the first thing that clicked for me was an Amazon affiliate site. So I just stuck with that. And things were different back then. It was 2013. So you literally could start a site, publish content, I wrote probably the first 50 articles or something like that. Number one, you didn't have to publish nearly as much. So I think I probably had like maybe 30 or 40 articles. And I wrote, again, most of it myself. I was ranking like number one for a couple terms that were getting like five to 6,000 searches per month within like two months. And within six months, I had like a $6,000, over $6,000 a month. And I was like, I'm brilliant. I'm going to quit my job. This is amazing. And turned out I got penalized like the next month or two. And it was through using private blog networks, which is what everyone was doing. And that's what everyone was teaching as well. So I followed along with Spencer Hawes and Niche Pursuits and that was basically how we were building links back then. And I started Niche Site Project, I think, within like five or six months of discovering the whole world to make money online. I did reach a point where I made like enough money where I was like, oh, you know what? I can, I feel qualified enough to share what I'm doing. I have a unique take because I'm a project manager. So, I went into it that way. And from the very beginning, I like split my time with blogging and uh, basically digital courses and affiliate marketing. So from the very beginning, I like was earning from both sources, which it actually like hurt both areas. So when you're, when you spread your time, like there's only so much you can do. Okay. So that's how I got started. Renzo says you're just starting to work on affiliate marketing. Would you write a few posts, like 15 or 20, or would I go with weekly and publishing and work your way up the sandbox right away? I'm not sure I follow your question exactly. Would you write a few posts or would you go with a weekly or more? I, so the way you're phrasing your question, is like either or, but I would publish as much as you can as quickly as possible. And then whatever is sustainable for you generally moving forward. 
as far as um, work your way through the sandbox, um, there's no way to really skip it. Um, you can shorten it if you're using like an age domain or if you buy an existing blog, that'll, you know, pretty much short, shorten the whole thing. But basically get started and, and work on it. And then in six or 12 months, you'll be out of the sandbox and then you won't have to worry about it anymore. This means war says part of the keyword golden ratio is search volume, but the tools vary greatly. What should we do, especially when the keyword is right at 0.25? Basically just pick one tool and use that one. The formula is very aggressive in you don't have to worry about it too much. So again, just pick one tool and use that one. The, since we're, we're deep, you know, we're an hour and 10 minutes into this live stream. 0.25 is the area that you want to be under, right? The truth is because the keyword volumes are just an estimate. If it's a little bit off, it's not a huge deal. So the point is you should probably try it and see how it reacts. You may be surprised that something is more competitive than you expected. But basically pick a tool, just use that tool. Don't worry about variations with other tools. It's just an estimate. And I think I missed a question. Oh yeah, DJ says, what's my take on the AI writing tools? Do I use them in product production? I've only tested the tools. I was not impressed and I thought I'm not going to waste my time looking at them anymore. I'm going to wait until other people have, <laughs> I'm going to wait until they're a little bit better. So I don't think they're where they need to be. The, I have heard of a couple instances where Maybe a, a bigger company has used the AI tools to just pump out an insane amount of content for sites that have a lot of keywords. And the, the content is not good, but they're putting out content at such a high velocity that they're actually getting a lot of traffic, which is kind of crazy to think about. So I would say, you know, it's worth, if you want to test out the AI tools, like, yeah, you know, give it a shot. I'm sure they have free trials or whatever. But from my perspective, it's probably not going to work very well. So I would test it out. You know, I'll be happy when people can prove me wrong. But most people that I chat with, they're like, ah, you know what? It does okay if you really babysit it, but you're better off just, you know, hiring someone to write it. God says you canceled your subscription to Jarvis. You wasn't you weren't using it enough, and the cost was the same as outsourcing to writers. Um, Zach says I'm really inspired with the success stories you share. Any beginner friendly niche advice or top niches to get into? Zach, so funny thing. We literally already had this question. Thanks for checking out the success stories. So we literally already had this question and I outsourced it to the audience. So you can rewind back and hear the specifics. But generally, the consensus is pick something that you're interested in or at least something that you are interested in learning about. You don't necessarily have to be passionate. You might be passionate, but basically pick something that you're interested in. And thanks for checking out these success stories. The The other side of that is like basically any niche is probably fine, except things that are medical related or money related or health related. Generally, it's probably going to be okay. All right. Laughing Hyena says, is it possible to earn $1,000 a month after 12 months? Yes, of course. If you post 300 articles, 
yeah, you don't have to post 300 articles. How many words should an article have? As many as it needs to. That's a, these are weird questions. Like you're trying to dissect, you're trying to get a like formula out of this. The thing I could tell you is if you have, uh, if I told you 2000 words, 300 posts, is it possible to make 1200 or a thousand dollars in 12 months? The answer is yes, that is possible. If you do what, if you publish X number of articles with X number of words, that doesn't mean that you will do it though. Ariel says, oh, this is interesting. You think your newest site has skipped the sandbox in just under three months. You have 135 articles, you're getting 40 clicks a day and a lot of content up front really helps. Yeah, that's great. And I think like the interesting thing is I I bet when it hits six or 12 months, it'll grow even faster. So that's the hard part. Like some people um, talk about the sandbox and there's like sort of different interpretations, but yeah, that kind of uh, growth sounds good. And I know, you know, one of the, one of the recent success stories, um, is Charlie and he's published like huge amounts of content and he's getting like a lot of traffic in, you know, under a year, but he's published a huge amount of content. So, you know, like you're saying, publishing a lot up front really helps Um, Saeed says, what do we think about a non-English website? You have a French website on farm animals and it already wrote 33 articles, but is it good with Ezoic? You know what? A uh, non-English is great. As far as with Ezoic, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, I think they probably mostly work with English advertisers, but I'm not sure. So I would go and check. I bet that's on their FAQs or somewhere where you can get some information. Someone may even know on the call. All right. So Gamer Boy says what we should do if we start a medical related website. Fuck if I know. And I would say if you have to ask, then you shouldn't do it. Gaz says, I love the fact that you've been doing this since the black hat days and share your experience with us. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is like, I mean, that's just what the practice was back then. And I mean, I remember Pat Flynn Smart passive income, his, you know, ultimate guide to link building and like going through it specifically. And I went over to Fiverr and I hired people to do link wheels and link pyramids with all these like terrible spammy links. And that's literally what Pat Flynn was teaching on his site. And I like followed it to the letter and it worked for a few months and then it would like all fall apart you know would totally get your site penalized but it worked for a little bit and it's interesting to hear because i i've now you know I've, I've met people who were doing it you know way, way before me you know they started in 2009 or something like that and the things that they were doing are crazy but that was just like the practice and how things worked and they made a ton of money and then it would like all fall apart like really quick. It's kind of crazy. And Saeed says, you meant, is it good with ads? The Ezoic precision was just an example. Should you focus on affiliate or ads are good? Got it. You should focus on both. Not focus on both, but you should use both. So generally, if you find a niche that has like products, there will be informational posts, informational keywords that people are interested in. So you should use both 
it is important to have both kinds of content generally. And then you may as well earn money from each of those different pieces of content. So ads are great. Uh, Saeed, you should check out some of the success stories that I've done on the channel. And then you'll see plenty of examples of you know, people earning money from both sources. And that way you could publish a lot of informational content that might rank more quickly. Google will like that if you have diverse content and then you can make money with the ads. All right, I think we are starting to wrap it up. I see we do have uh, quite a few likes, 27, which is great. We had a good crew today. Thanks folks for popping in. If you have the ability to hit the thumbs up, I'd appreciate it. If you didn't sign up for the email list, please do. NicheSiteProject.com, green button, enter your name, email address. In about two weeks, I'm going to send out a free email mini course. So sign up for the email list. I'm going to talk about it more because I've, I, I got to be honest, uh, generally I do a shitty job uh, like promoting and getting people over to the email list. So, you know, tell a friend. I also would love it if you subscribe to the channel. I have been trying to post more often on the community tab, putting polls up and stuff. So one poll that I published was around whether you would like to own a website that had stable revenue all year round or if you had like some seasonality. Basically, everyone said they wanted stable revenue. I thought there might be one or two people that would want to have the seasonality and that way they can make up for it in the other months. And they, I was wondering if some people would see it as an opportunity but basically everyone wanted stable revenue. The next day, and I would love it if the people that are watching checked out the community tab and answered the poll. So I was thinking, well, how much more do people want to earn if it was a seasonal niche? So how much more revenue makes up for the fact that it's seasonal? But 10... 25, 40, 50, and 60%. People wanted to earn a huge amount more to make up for the seasonality, which is very interesting. It's a psychological sort of comfort and expectation thing going on. I, I'm sure there's some word for it, but it was very interesting to see people wanted to earn way more money <laughs> to make up for it. Okay, cool. Well, thanks everyone for hopping in. And I think that's it for today. So do check out uh, 